Hi, I'm Rusty Wise with the Wise News Network, and today we have a special guest on Wise Wednesdays. It's Gregory Pesor. Now, Greg, explain a little bit about genealogy and what all it entails. Well, genealogy is your past history of your family, um, which is called, if you do a chart, it's called ancestral chart or pedigree chart. And it, our families, most of them came from Europe. And most people have no idea where they come from in Europe. And they have no idea about their family history. And I've been doing this since probably the mid-70s. And what got me involved was a tomb rock. What happened, my family was buried at Mount Zion Church. And I supposedly had a grandfather who got killed in the Civil War. And I had been to look at his marker before, but when I got out of the Navy and I think I was teaching school, and I remember going up there and looking at that tomb rock and something just dawned on me about the date. And supposedly he died, according to the tomb rock, May 8, 1865. And it clicked in my head, there's no way he could have got killed in the Civil War if he died on May 8, 1865, because the war was over with. And that's what got me started to find out why that date was on that tomb rock. Tell us a little bit about Gregory, your background, a little history on you. Okay. I uh, was born in 1949. My dad was Bill Pesor. He worked at Carolina Freight. My mother was Catherine Adams Pesor. I grew up on Rickway Road in Cherville when I went to Cherville High School. And uh, like most boys in Cherville, I loved baseball. Played, you know, played a lot of ball in Cherville. Played for the American Legion a couple of years and um, was in college at Gardner Webb College. And I had to, I was about to get drafted because of some kind of, I went from a quarter system to a semester system and I lost a couple of hours in the conversion and I lost my 2S and went to a 1A. And instead of getting drafted, I decided to uh, join the Navy. So uh, I was paying my way through college, working at Carolina Freight, like a lot of other people. And then I went in the Navy. And when I got out of the Navy, I started teaching school after I graduated from Gardner Webb and uh, stayed in Kings Mountain. And I taught school, and then I retired from the school system. Fifty years ago, I guess it was one of the best years of my life because I started playing fast-pitch softball over in Guam, and I made the all-star team, and we we were chosen to play in the World Series, which is a true World Series, and I was the only person from the States on the team, and we traveled to Manila, and we finished seventh in the world. Well, when you start a process like this, or when you first got started, in this tri-county area like Lincoln, Cleveland, That's and Gaston, right. did you find there was just was not a whole lot of history or it was just fragmented? What did you find when you first got started as far as the detail of it? Okay. Like, let me give you the history of Cherville. Okay. Now, some people say Cherryville, but if you're from Cherryville, <laughs> you're, you say Cherville. <clears throat> well, Cherville wasn't really named Cherville or Cherryville until 1862, and then 72. Of, anyway, about that time frame when they started calling it Cherbill. It had a lot mm -hmm. to do with the railroad track. But the history goes back 100 years before that, a little bit over 100 years. History of Cherbill started what became Cherbill. It really started below Walmart. Yeah, okay. A man by the name of Moses Moore owned the land. When he bought, he was a land speculator. When he bought the land, other that's when people started moving in from Europe. Most of them were German, but there were some that came from uh, Scotland, Ireland, England, but most Germans moved into this area. So Moses Moore bought a lot of land. 1762, he sold 300 acres to Valentine Mooney. 
On the same day, he also sold 300 acres to Thomas Black. Thomas Black is where his land is where the old Avery Farm is, which is in Krause. Uh, Valentine's land is where Antioch is. He's buried at Antioch Baptist Church, which a lot of people, you got to, going down 150, you got to look over to the left, and it's setting out. It's like a old church. It was formed in 1802, I believe. But that was on Valentine Mooney's land. Well, Valentine had a brother named Christian Mooney. Christian Mooney's land was down around Tryon School. He was the judge under King George. He was also the judge when we declared independence, Christian Mooney. Many people in this area, that's their ancestors. But other people lived here too, and they started moving into this area. Uh, Moses Moore's land was down behind Walmart in that area. He had a boy named John Moore. John Moore was a Tory, which means he was loyal to the king. He had just came up in Charleston, I believe in May of 1780. He came back to the farm, and they had a meeting there in June. I believe it was 10 days later they decided to meet over at Ramsar Mill. The Patriots found out about it, and that's how the battle of Ramsar Mill started. The, a lot of people don't understand it was neighbor fighting neighbor. It was a civil war. John Moore's sister married Joshua Roberts, and Joshua Roberts lived on the same land and he was a patriot. So there was a lot of history in Cherville. And then uh, as time went along, the black man who was named Thomas, he had a son named um, Ephraim. Ephraim settled on the same land, and it's there in Krause, and some people call it the Avery Farm. And then Ephraim started having children, and one of them was Stephen, Stephen Black. He moved, and on downtown, um, what became Cherville on the east side was his land. And then one of my grandpas was his older brother, Thomas. There was two Thomases. This was a younger Thomas. This is, he uh, moved away went to war in 1812. Then he comes back to what became Cherville, and he built a cabin. And that cabin is where the old, this is where City Hall is right now, somewhere in that block where City Hall is. That cabin stayed there for about 35 years, and it was probably put on a sled and drugged down the Lee Black Road and if you go on Lee Black Road, that cabin is still there. And somebody's living in that cabin. And that's the Thomas Black Cabin. Well, Stephen's boy was Benasia. I always pronounce it wrong. And he had a tree growing in his yard. It was a white pine. It was really Stephen's yard, but anyway, it became Benasia's yard. That white pine, that's what people started calling what became Cherwell white pine. It was originally called white pine. That's correct. Now, what happened was that white pine was cut down, a table was made out of it, and it's in the old black schoolhouse downtown. The person that fixed that up was Jack Bingham. So Jack fixed that, uh, the old black school, which was located down behind Alvin McSwain on Lee Black and Black Road. But they were, um, young people don't realize this. I'm sure you do. People went to one-room schoolhouses. They wasn't no public, I mean, they were public schools, but everybody went to a one-room or a small school. And it was unbelievable how many schools there were. There were 32 black, black schools in Cleveland County. I mean, that's a lot, and a lot of white schools. Uh, 
so that was in the 1800s when the schools really started. People, you know, getting public education and they were going to different schools. And then the black school was just one of many. Now, how did Cherryville get its name? Or Cherryville, Cherryville, uh, however you want to say uh, it. I'm glad you I try to say Cherryville, but I know around here some, some people say Cherryville. But how did it get its name? Okay, I was jumping around. Um, <laughs> okay, it became White Pine. Stephen Black, who I mentioned, he married a lady by the name of Elizabeth Brown. She was from South Carolina. She started setting out cherry trees, but way before the railroad track uh, railroad came through here. So those cherry trees, of course, started growing, and the train started coming through in the early part of the Civil War. Well, the maybe right before the Civil War. It was still called White Pine. And then the engineers started seeing all these cherry trees blooming down near Bojangles. Um, and they started, some of them started calling it Cherryville. And that's the beginning of it becoming Cherryville. Well, there was two people lived in Cherryville at that time. One was a Dilling, and he had a lumber company. He furnished the wood. And then... Uh, David Mooney lived on the west side of Cherville, and he had a big family. And William and his brothers, they ended up in Kings Mountain. Well, Dilling moved to Kings Mountain. Ten years after Cherville started, in 1872, Kings Mountain. There's a big connection between Cherville and Kings Mountain. That's what, how Kings Mountain got became Kings Mountain because of people moving out of Cherub were going in that direction. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. A lot of people don't know that. And that was the railroads. Okay. The railroads is what started these small towns. Tell us a little bit about, as you started the genealogy, when you first started, how did you find out things? Did you go to the courthouse, deeds, records? How did you, I mean, with now with technology, it's a lot easier. Can you explain the, the progression of technology and how it's a lot easier now than it used to be? Because what you did early, I know, had to be difficult. Uh, you know, the research has already been done in most families. Um, take the whole family. Robert Cartner wrote a book, and it's a nice book, but the, a lot of that research had already been done many, many years ago on a lot of these families. Uh, the Strap family, let me just take them for instance. They moved into Chir- what became terrible a little bit later, but, you know, the first one buried at Mount Zion. His daddy's buried down in Alexis, and that was the pioneer. Uh, there's two pioneers of the Strap family, as history went along, the Straps intermarried uh, with other families, just like the Dallingers. But a lot of that research had been done many, many years, and then people started adding to it. It was pretty tough to people that did the research because uh, they had to go by deeds. Um, past history had been passing on, just like the New Year's shoes, one, you know, it was passed on from one generation to the mm-hmm. next. Now technology has changed all that. Uh, now, Broad River started in 1980, and that's a genealogical society. But the computers changed what well, changed the whole world. About 1988, 1989, they came out with software. Well, I was already asking about the software. I kept asking them. People that was involved in computers were there any software, and finally software started coming out. It became a lot easier because you could put it in a database, and I've got a database between 250,000 and 300,000 people. From this. Well, today I know they have DNA, like Ancestry.com and all of these others, and I know the DNA has really cleaned up some things probably. That's correct. They've even cleaned up some murders, and uh, people... Uh, you know, it's done a lot. Uh, DNA, I've, now I got mine done through uh, National Geographic, and then I got it done through Ancestry. But when you print out a chart, uh, just like the one I did today, uh, you can match up 
the DNA, the guy did today was English and German mostly. He did have a little bit of Scottish. But you can take that DNA and look at your ancestors, and you can, if, now there's mistakes out there everywhere, but you can tell from your DNA because your report or your pedigree chart is going to be, say if it's 40% German, you can tell when you get back six, seven generations, about 40% of them German. So it sort of matches up most of the time. Listen, what would you say to younger generations on how important history is? Because with today's technology, with cell phones and computers, the younger generation doesn't entertain history as much. A few of them are getting into it. I was at Broad River last night, and uh, a young person came in. He's coming back next Tuesday, and I'm going to help him with his genealogy. I've got somebody else helping him also. Uh, as far as uh, I think we should never forget our history, especially the history of the Revolutionary War. Um, we should. When Eisenhower went into Germany and he found out about the Jewish people, what had happened, you probably know this, he made the local people clean up the corpses the Jewish people, he, you know, said that we should never, ever forget what happened. And I'm a big believer in that we should never, ever forget our history. Well, a lot of times the decisions we make are based off history or historical instances that have happened in the past. That's so correct. that's the decisions we make. So, uh, you know, you have to remember the history today to make your decisions in the future. That's correct. Our past mistakes is how we learn. If someone is interested in getting in touch with you, can they message you on Facebook? Is that the best way? That's the best way. Just message me on, message me on Facebook. And then. And you're under Gregory Pesower. Yes. I've got a site mm -hmm. on Facebook, my name, but I've got that uh, Cleveland County. I'm on it also. And I post all kinds of things. I'll go back and post somebody's great great grandma, you know, a picture of her if I find it. And then sometimes I'll give who's living today, like in Cherville, I'll go back and uh, I'm trying to think of something. I can't, a picture of somebody maybe born in 1860. Now they're hard to find. You know, photography didn't come out to the 1840s. So any picture you see before 1840, it's not a picture. It's a drawing, drawing. or a painting. Uh, it might look like a picture, but it's not. So photography came out, and you can find photography pictures in this area of people that were born, you know, during the Civil War, a little before the Civil War. And this is what it takes a lot of my time. I'll, I'll go back and find, say, uh, somebody's picture, and then I'll get in my database, and I'll put their great-great-great-grandchildren that's still living. And, I, you know, I, people like that kind of stuff. Well, Gregory Pesour, I really appreciate you coming in on Wise Wednesday. I've learned a lot. I know the audience is going to learn a lot. And our viewers, I'm sure you've mentioned some names that a lot of families recognize. And I really appreciate it. It's, oh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And can't thank you enough for oh, coming in today. You're welcome. So today on Wise Wednesday, we've learned a lot about our history and, and today we can make decisions that will be affecting our tomorrow and our future. And we really appreciate Gregory Peso for coming in today on Wise Wednesdays. I'm Rusty Wise with the Wise News Network. Thank you and have a great day.